Good evening, Zoomers. Welcome. Nice to see you tonight. Glad to have you with us. And uh, the uh, snow uh, can come anytime it wants because we're all safely inside, right? Yep. That's so I'm right. um, glad to have you with us. Um, tonight we're in chapter uh, 30, what number? 33 tonight, right? The Gospel Call and Effective Calling. Um, were you looking for a long reading tonight? Yes, it's so short. Um, so I hope you got to read it several times um, and review it because it, it was a nice little reading, but we'll explain why it was uh, short in uh, just a few minutes. So glad to have you along with us tonight uh, if you're joining us via Zoom. And make sure you have your text ready. I will use the text uh, significantly tonight. We'll just follow the outline of the few pages that he gave us. We'll supplement a little bit tonight. I did send Zoomers a, um, an outline uh, to your email. So God willing, I sent it to the correct email and you folks were able either to um, put it on another electronic device or to print it off so you can have it near you. Um, it's, it's helpful a little bit tonight because there are some parts that I'll supplement from what we normally do in, in the Grudem text tonight. Okay. So uh, with that, just join me in a word of prayer, please, as we get started. Heavenly Father, thank you for the, the glory of this day and the grace that you have given us, Lord, to have breath in our lungs and that our minds and hearts would be directed by your spirit to things above that we might exalt and worship Jesus Christ as our Savior and our Lord. And Jesus, that, that we would honor you tonight with the uh, meditation of our hearts and of our lips with the questions that we ask and uh, with the scriptures that you open to us. Uh, so be glorified, we pray. Uh, grant us, Holy Spirit, uh, your teaching, your working within us, um, that we might draw closer to Christ and be conformed to his image. In his precious name we pray, amen. <laughs> Okay, well, we've um, got uh, a great time to be together tonight, and uh, we're talking about the gospel call. Yes, a very short reading, and effective calling. I'm glad that uh, Grudem didn't, um, um, well, he could have made it a lot longer, I think, <laughs> uh, but for our sakes, you got a little reading break this week. And in many cases, though, uh, many uh, theologians or pastors or or Bible teachers will combine uh, this subject, the gospel call, with next week's subject, regeneration. So those two, if you combine them, I mean, his writing on regeneration next week, chapter 34, isn't exactly a mega reading either. But when the two of them would be combined, which is what most Bible teachers or preachers would do. They would combine the gospel call and regeneration in one teaching or one uh, chapter. Then you'd have a longer reading. Uh, but I think Grudem nicely uh, separates those two so we can, you know, take some bite-sized pieces on some very important Bible doctrines and then uh, talk about them significantly and, and make sure we're understanding what Scripture says there. So here's our opening question for our live class. Uh, so I, <laughs> yep, you can't hide behind the book now, right? Uh, but we, but we need somebody hopefully to uh, answer this uh, from our live class. And for our, our Zoom folks, um, I am still learning about how to use chat the best way possible. It will help me, Zoomers, if you can uh, limit your chatting amongst yourselves, because when I look at the chat, I have to look through everything you've chatted in order to find the things that you want to direct to me. So um, it, it's helpful if, if you can limit your chatting or put my name in big red letters on the chat you want me to see. That'll help me uh, to, to zero through the chatting to find the questions or comments that you want to share. And you're welcome right away to send me one. So here's our opening question for our live group. We'll start with them. Is God's call to be saved and a preacher's call to a congregation to be saved, is that the same thing? Is God's call, as you read it, I trust you read it this week, 
uh, calling people to be saved? And is a preacher's call in a church for people to be saved? Is that the same thing? And uh, to, you can take this apart and pick at it and go any way you want. So, but don't forget to to uh, explain your answer if you want to say yes or no. <laughs> Anybody from our live class want to chew on that one to get us started? Go ahead, Mel. Thanks. No, they're not the same. Okay, Mel says not the same, and he'll give us maybe a follow-up or a, why would you say they're not the same? God's call and a preacher's call. Go ahead. God called you. Uh, basically, it's an automatic answer that you, you follow through, or I don't know how to explain it, more personal, whereas the preacher's call can be rejected. Okay, so uh, we got a response here where God's call does something effectively and immediately where a preacher's call or any Bible-believing Christian who's sharing the gospel with someone else realizes that, that you know, when they invite somebody to know Jesus as Savior and Lord, that can be rejected. Um, so, and, and we might experience that frequently. If you have shared the gospel, I trust with folks in your immediate vicinity or work people or such, uh, you know there there might be that kind of difference. Anyone else that want to respond, please go ahead to the opening question. I would say it can be the same thing. If the preacher is using God's word, God doesn't, God's word has to come to you somehow. It's going to usually come by means of people. So God's word can be spoken by a preacher and that can be God's call to you. And it can, you can reject God's call too. Not everyone is saved that God speaks to. People reject it or they may not accept it immediately. It may take more than months for the person to respond in the right way. So. Excellent. So here we had another response again from another angle on the same question that they could be exactly the same thing. God's calling coming through a human a uh, preacher or a lay person, uh, any one of you dear folks in, in class tonight, I mean, it could be exactly the same thing where you share the gospel uh, with someone and that person uh, responds to the good news and, and knows they need Jesus as their, their Savior and as their Lord. So um, that's a great way to answer as well, too. Did we miss anybody else who wanted to jump in on that one? Anyone else? Okay, good. I hope that helps us to chew on this subject a little bit. So here's three big topics that we want to cover for tonight. Three big topics. Number one, God himself calls people to be saved. That's number one. Number two, people call other people to be saved. That's our second uh, subject tonight. And number three, people call God to be saved. So it depends upon which arrow you're looking at. God calling us kind of is that arrow down, right? People calling other people to be saved is kind of a horizontal arrow, right? But then finally, each one of us individually and personally has to come to that point where we ask God to save us, where we ask him to forgive our sin and to save us. Hey, Robert. You mind if Richie... Uh join you this evening? Sure, Richie can join us tonight, by all means. This is Pastor Robert. Hey, Richie. This is Richie. Nice I'm that you joined us back. Hey, Mike. Hey, Mike. Yes, Set this up for Richie, would you? And you can open this to for him to page uh, 692. Would you set that up for him? Thanks. Okay, so those are the three things that we're talking about tonight, right? God calls people to be saved, people call people to be saved, and people call on God, right, to be saved. So I hope that helps you to kind of digest some of what we're looking at tonight, okay? So we're in this subject, the gospel call and effective calling, we are learning how God applies salvation to our lives, so God, we learned last week, the very hard doctrine of election, that God elects people to be part of his family, and he does that when? When does God elect people to be part of his family? I, I, yes, before the world was created, God elected before time. We learned that last week. And now God calls people 
to be part of his family in time. And that call comes at different times. Now, perhaps some of you were called to a saving relation with Jesus in your youth, right? Some of you might have been called to a relationship with Jesus as Savior when you were a teenager or a young adult at college or a medium adult or maybe an old adult. Maybe some people came to a saving faith in Jesus as an older person, but God calls individually, right, to individual people in time, even though his election is a mysterious thing that, of course, occurred before time. So um, does anybody here tonight in our live class want to share, and I don't have to say names, uh, when were you called to a saving relationship with Jesus, and in what context were you in a Bible study? Were you in a church? D did you respond to a radio program? Were you at work and sh someone shared the gospel? Anybody want to just share a little bit of your your testimony of how God called you and when he called you? We're picking on everybody tonight, Richie. Hey, Richie says he's going to jump in. Go for it, sir. Ten years old, sitting on the end of my mother's bed in her bedroom. And she just had a talk with me. Okay. And I'll never forget it. Wow, sweet. Uh, our friend Richie tonight says he was 10 years old. Uh, you see, Richie, we're on Zoom tonight as well, too, sir. Okay. This That's why this thing is in front of me. 10 years old, and uh, he was uh, talking with his mother. And she shared the gospel with, uh, with you. And he says, I'll never forget that. And that was the time when uh, he knew God called him uh, to a saving relationship with Jesus. So Grudem, again, our, our, uh, our textbook tonight, he treats the gospel call and regeneration as two separate doctrines. Uh, so next week, we're going to study and, and remind ourselves of the doctrine of regeneration. Most theologians are going to do that together, though. They combine the two and do, do them together. Now, um, as we look at Romans 8, verse 30, that's our key passage for tonight. I believe you're going to find that on page 692, right underneath letter A, effective calling. So if you don't have your Bible nearby, just look at Romans 8, verse 30. This verse uniquely shares with us a sequence of the work of God in people's lives. Romans 8, 30. Those whom he predestined, that's what we studied last week, he also called. That's what we're studying tonight. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Now, I know to all you dear folks, I don't look very glorious tonight, do I? No, my hair is turning silver, my back hurts, and all kinds of other things are going amok, right, George? But the glorification part is a promise of God who elected us in eternity past, of which you and I will never get to open that book of book of life that God has with the names that he's elected. I mean, it, it, it's just not privy. You can't go to the public library and ask him to download it for you. But we can learn of God's gracious work of election when the gospel is shared and people respond to Jesus in repentance and faith. That's when you get your glimpse at the book of life, because God in his mercy and in his grace calls you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. So, uh, you know, in the book of Romans, we talk about a golden chain uh, of Bible verses and passages. I often called Romans 8 verse 30 that golden chain because it shows the work that God uniquely does in our lives. He predestines, number two, he calls, number three, he justifies, which means he declares me not guilty because of Jesus, right? And number four, he will bring me all the way to glorification. Shed this old body, I'm going to give you a resurrected body, Robert, which, you know, is, is the grace of Jesus, right, when he, when he calls me home. OK, so we know that predestination occurs before time, but the doctrine of God's calling, it occurs 
at various times. So Richie being called at age 10, some of you may have been called, you know, at a different age in life, right? It happens at different times. And that's uh, part of the mystery of God, but also a great part of his mercy. So we're going to talk about terms. We're in our introduction tonight. If you're looking on page 693, 693 for most of you, near the bottom of the page, the last paragraph, Grudem discussed very important terms related to the doctrine of the gospel call. So we're going to review those two. So you're going to see them in that text, uh, or maybe you've highlighted some of them. So when we talk about the gospel call, we're going to make two big categories. So on your outline for tonight, Richie, there's a piece of paper just to your left there. You can grab one of those if you care. So then we have two big categories, the general call of God and the specific call of God. So we're going to make two big categories. That's what we're talking about tonight. The general call of God and the specific call of God. Now, the general call is the external call when you share the gospel with someone else or when a minister shares the gospel with a whole congregation and invites people to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. We call that a general call. It's also called an external call. You'll see that that, uh, term, I think, in, in the Grudem text. It's external because it's given outwardly to people or to congregations um, or at various events. It's also called the universal call because as God wants all to be saved, he's commissioned us to share the gospel message with everybody. So the general call of the gospel, when you share how to have a relationship with Jesus with anybody, or when a minister does it in a church or a ministry setting, it's a universal call. The gospel then is scattered like seed, and we are, of course, 100% dependent on God to make the soil productive. That's a thing that you and I can't do. I can't change a person's heart, right? Can't do that. Only God can do that, but he's called us to share the gospel message with everybody. So we know that this call, this general call, can be declined and it can be rejected. Do you know of anybody in your personal life or extended life who has had the gospel shared with them and they said, no, no thanks, not interested? Maybe you can think of a person or two on our Zoom friends as well, too. So let's talk about the second group or the second major part of our doctrine study tonight is the specific call. The specific call of God is often called a particular call because this is where God in his wisdom in eternity past chose some to be saved, the doctrine of election, and thus in time, God will call those specific people. And of course, he does that internally within us versus externally, the way we share the gospel with other people. So the specific call of God, we call it particular because it goes to those people whom God has elected. We call it internal because that's where God is going to change my heart of stone to be a heart of flesh. We call it limited to the elect, the specific call of God. And of course, we call it divine, that it is God's work. It's not a human can never change anybody else's heart or mind. I, I, I just can't. You might think I'm a persuasive teacher or preacher, but that I can't change your mind or your heart. Only God can change a heart from being a heart of stone to being a heart that is responsive to him. So we talk about the specific divine work of God. And as Grudem talked about as well, too, the specific call of God cannot be declined or rejected. God, in calling someone to a saving relationship, ensures that my heart and mind are changed 
to be, of course, responsive to him. So a human call of the gospel, human sharing of the gospel, that can be declined. But God's calling to a particular person, the Bible teaches us that it, it cannot be rejected or declined. So now we're going to um, just talk a little bit more about each category. We're going to talk about the general call, which Grudem didn't give any time to. He really did. You see letter A, he starts in with the effective call. So I want to talk a little bit about the general call so that we all understand what this is and what it can or cannot do. So for that purpose, friends, that's where your outline will help you tonight if you were able to glance at that or print it for yourselves. And you'll notice the underlined categories on your outline are the categories that Grudem did not address. Oh, so yeah, grab uh, an outline or two there, Ruth, for you and Barry. Um, and then follow along with this. So we'll look at a couple of uh, passages too. Um, they're all noted on your outline, the ones not in the Grudem text, and we'll make mention of those as well too. Okay, so let's pause and give you a chance to, to respond with the basic question of what is the general call of the gospel? What is it? So again, we're not in the Grudem text right now. We're giving supplemental work. So what's the general call of the gospel all about? Let's see if we can put it in our own words. When a person shares the gospel. Yeah, that's when a person shares the gospel with someone else. It may be one-on-one -on -one, or it may be one to a whole group. It could be to your family. It could be to people you don't know. Somebody, you're, if you're doing a Bible study in your own home with your neighbors who don't know Jesus, the general call. It is an invitation, right, to all people to know and trust Christ as Savior, the general call, okay? So how do people receive this general call? We're not talking about AT&T, are we? We're not talking about CenturyTel or whatever phone service you're using. So when we use the term call, right? How do people receive the general call? Of course. I would, for me, when I look at when I hear what you're saying, I'm thinking of Jesus and the and the uh, parable of the seed sower. You know that that's that, that God grown his seed, the, the general gospel of the truth of the kingdom. Right. Land in all kinds of fields. And and he this doesn't know what, what field is going to what how it's going to respond. Okay, but and the seed in the parable is what? In the parable of the sower, the seed represents what? The word of God. The word of God. And specifically, I mean, because granted, folks, if you're gonna to try to share the entire Bible with somebody, they might say, Hey, I'm gonna to go to bed now. <laughs> so what specific part of the word of God are we talking about when we talk about calling people? To a relationship with Jesus. What part? Jesus dying the specific gospel, the part about Christ being a substitute for a guilty sinner like me. So we're talking of a, of a portion of Holy Scripture, of all of it. That part which reminds me uh, and teaches me that God does want a relationship with this guilty sinner and how to have that relationship. So we're talking about that specific part. So Romans 10 verse 14 how then can they call on the one they have not believed in? So I gave that, I think, in your notes, Romans. Is that in your notes somewhere? The Old Testament general call? No, I might have added that one after the outline story. And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching it to them or just sharing it with them? You see? So this is how the general call goes out. People share the good news. So tonight... At your tables, you've got, you know, all kinds of different sample tracks and ways to share the good news even with people. Feel free to take anything home. Sorry, Zoomers. I couldn't send those to you. They're here tonight on our tables. Uh, but a lot of you use different tracks and different gospel presentations to share the gospel with people. The four spiritual laws, the Romans road, right? Is that true for some of you on Zoom? You, you've maybe had your favorite. Well, you know what? A good old track is not a bad thing. It's a good and useful tool. Stick some in your pocket or your, your purse so that you have them ready, okay? So now we look in Scripture because the Scripture shows us frequently from cover to cover various invitations for people 
to have a relationship with the living God. So that's where I think your first one, Isaiah 55, verse one on your outline, the Old Testament general call, Isaiah 55. Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come by and eat. Here's a general gospel invitation, right, in the Old Testament, where God says, come to me, come to me. This one is almost the mirror, then, of our Bible memory verse for tonight, Matthew 11, right, 28. Come to me, all ye who are are weary and heavy burdened, right, and I'll give you rest. So the Old Testament call, the New Testament call, they have a lot in common, right? Isaiah 55, verse 6. Many of you know this, Isaiah 55, verse 6. Seek the Lord, finish the verse if you can, while he may be found. Friends, today, the book of Hebrews says, is the day of salvation. If you hear God's voice today, don't wait until tomorrow, because guess what? What what may not happen? You may not live that long. Today is the day of salvation. God says, if you hear his voice today, don't deliberate and say, well, I'll think about that and get back to you later, God. Because your life, I mean, in certain cases, Pastor Al preached about the, uh, the, the farmer who built bigger barns, and then he didn't realize that this night your life will be demanded of you. See, we don't know that. So seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him. Do you see that? That's, that's from the sinner to God. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way. This is commonly uh, spoken of as repentance, right? Let the wicked forsake his way and the evil man his thoughts. Let him turn to the Lord, for he will have mercy on him and to our God, for he will freely pardon. That's good news. God who will freely pardon, right? God who will who will change my heart and forgive my sin in the blood of Jesus. Ezekiel 14, verse 6, repent, turn from your idols and renounce all your detestable practices. So the Old Testament has a variety of gospel invitations that are inviting everybody, like seed, Mike said, scattered on soil. It's scat- we want to share the gospel as far and wide as we can so that it, it's, it, it hits everybody. And uh, we're going to trust God, of course, to, to do the internal work to change a person's heart. Now, let's go to the New Testament. The New Testament general call comes in many, many different passages. Matthew 9.13. This is the calling of Matthew as a, as a um, disciple of Jesus. And there, after calling Matthew... Jesus said, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners, right? I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Jesus generally calls sinners to come to himself and to know him as Savior and as Lord. And now Matthew 22, 14. If you do have your Bibles nearby, turn to Matthew 22. I'm going to do about four passages in that text. Matthew 22, 14 is the parable of the wedding banquet. This is a great teaching for us tonight on the general call of God. Verse 14 is one of those gold mine passages. It is very, very significant for our study tonight. And of course, for some folks, it may be very, very troubling. But because we studied election last week, we're studying the gospel call tonight. I hope verse 14 becomes a precious passage for you tonight. Have you found it in your Bibles? Matthew twenty-two fourteen. 14. There at the end of the parable, so we're getting to the end of the parable first, right, before we talk about the specifics of it. There Jesus says, for many are what? Many are called. There's a general call. Many are called. The seed of the gospel goes out over the whole world. That's what God wants. Many are called. But Few are chosen. That's talking about election. In this tiny verse, friends, you have both election addressed, which again is in the mystery of God. We can't look at that book. And the general call of the gospel. Many are called, uh, King James. The NIV said many are invited, right? In a given church service, on a given Sunday, when the gospel is presented and people are invited, There are some who respond and there are some who don't. It doesn't mean that the ones who don't 
will never respond, right? But we just don't know. Will they have another uh, chance to respond again? So this is the conclusion of the parable, talking about general call. Many are invited or called, but few are chosen. This reminds me of the Matthew 7 text too, right? Where Jesus says, uh, narrow is the road that leads to anybody to life. And how many people are on it? Very few there be that are on that road. Broad is the road that leads to, and how many are on that road? Many are on that road. This passage, of course, parallels that as well too. Now, just glance in your Bibles that you would, if you would, Matthew 22, verse 3. Matthew 22, verse 3. In this parable, right, um, God is the king and he sends his servants out to those who had been invited to the wedding banquet. There's your key word, invited or called, verse 3, to the wedding banquet to tell them, come, right? And what do people do sometimes to the general invitation? What do they sometimes do? Verse 3, they refuse it. No thanks, not interested. You can have your Jesus. You can have your church. You can have your church politics or whatever response some people have, right? But no, they refuse. The general call can be refused or not responded to. Verse 10, please. Matthew twenty two ten. So the servants went out into the streets because here the king prepared a banquet, right? What's he going to do? Leave all the food rot? <laughs> he set up the tables and the chairs and all everything for the, for this wedding banquet. No, no, no. He wants people to be in his house. So verse ten, the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, both good and bad, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. Now notice. In that tiny little expression there, go out and find anybody, good or bad. Election, election, which we learned last week, and the specific call of God are not based on what? Uh, uh, in this verse, there, it's not based on your holiness or lack thereof. It's not based on your character. It's not based on how sinful you are or how little you sin. Good or bad. See, that's not the determining factor for why God elects and why God calls, right? It's in his mercy and it's in his grace that he does this. So then we look at verse 11 right after Matthew 22, 11. This is interesting. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. Now, this is a strange picture to us, right? Because when your children got married, you didn't issue wedding clothes to your guests, did you? This was something that was typical, though, in the first century Jewish culture. The father of the groom would issue a wedding garment to everybody who came into the chamber. This is a picture in the New Testament, then, of the the righteousness of Jesus Christ, which clothes us who have trusted in him, who have been called by him, and thus enables us to be in his presence in heaven one day. You're not righteous. You, you know, I mean, he, the, the good and the bad were called into the house, right? But the good and the bad are given something they don't inherently have. They don't have the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ. So that's a garment that is given as a gift to those whom God calls. Here it's pictured as a man who somehow snuck in through the servant quarter door and is in the banquet without the wedding garment of Christ's righteousness. Sadly, we notice at the end of the parable, though, this man is what? What happens to him who is not clothed with the king's righteousness? He's thrown out, which is a horrible picture, right? A dreadful picture. I need the righteousness of Jesus, which is a gift I cannot create. I can't make it. I can't earn it. I don't deserve it. I need to have this gift given to me uh, by God himself. So that's one of the key uh, texts in the New Testament about the general call. Many are invited, right? Many are invited, but few are chosen. Remember all the original guests? They all made excuses. They didn't come. 
And uh, they, they weren't uh, in among the elect, all the original guests, the picture there. Very few are those who were elected. Now, we can go to other texts such as John 7, 37. This is a general invitation uh, to a relationship with Jesus. If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. That's parallel to the Old Testament invitation, Isaiah 55, verse 1, right? Jesus says, if you're thirsty, here, if, if, if there's something dry in your life, we're talking about our life, which is dead and empty without God. He says, I can give you thirst. Jesus himself is that, okay? Now, um, have you encountered different responses that people have had to the gospel? Have you yourself shared the gospel someday? So it gives you a chance now process and share a little bit. What different responses have you personally, don't talk about anybody else's work, but what have you encountered when you shared the gospel with anybody? And, and Zoomers, you can send me a note on this because I'll check on you in just a minute here. But live group, how, how about for you? What responses have various people given when you shared the gospel? My experience, they just don't respond to it. They hear it and they, you can almost tell like a bell just comes over their eye because they don't want to hear no more or talk about God and they just won't go on to something else. They know you're a Christian, you start talking about things of God, and you start presenting the gospel to them, and they start to pull away, or they just have an excuse not to listen, and, you know, and they're friends of yours, you work with them and stuff, and they just don't accept it, you know, they just... Okay, so what we just heard, Zoomers, is, you know, just uh, sharing the gospel, and sometimes people just zone out, or they pull away. Uh, from from what you're saying. Um, so good. Anybody else? Have you had a, a various response? I mean, good or bad, right? A anybody else had a response uh, that they can share about uh, when you shared the gospel with someone? Okay, so the response of you're not any better than me, right? Yeah, so maybe who are you? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and that's for the response is you're right. That's for sure. <laughs> I'm not any better, you know, in any way, shape, or form. So yeah, some folks want to make, uh, you know, the invitation to trust Christ for forgiving your sin and for salvation into a comparison game, right? Well, you know, maybe I need Christ if I was as bad as you, <laughs> um, but it's not a comparison game, is it? Uh, at all. So. Uh, Zoomers, have you sent me something uh, as far as responses you've encountered uh, in sharing the gospel with people? Um, uh, somebody wrote here, I'm, I'm good, I'm a good person. Um, oh, somebody just typed a deer in the headlight look. Okay, yeah, that they just plain zone out. You share the gospel and, they're, they're, uh, you know, they're just, they stare you down and don't know what to do next. It, thanks for sharing that because, you know, the Old Testament particularly talks about our sin problem in this way. Um, what, what happens to my eyes because of sin in my life? I'm blinded. And what happened, the Bible says, what happens to my ears because of sin in my life? I go deaf. Folks, this is the spiritual problem of sin. I can't see God in my life or in my world, and I can't hear the gospel message. So, you know, deer in the headlight uh, kind of a thing, right? So some folks uh, maybe responded here positively. Some folks accepted the gospel. Um, uh, a former drinking friend from years ago said, stop preaching. Uh, you know what? I just don't want to hear you sharing the gospel with me one more time, right? One told me to keep my holier-than-thou attitude to myself. Um, and, and, or some people may turn it into uh, sharing the gospel into this comment here. Uh, people question why God allows pain and suffering. So if your God is so good, why does he allow pain and suffering? And thus it changes the whole conversation from a, a salvation issue to you know, God's justice or righteousness. So thanks for sharing that. I think I went dead on, on one of my batteries. Can you still hear me on Zoom? One of my, okay, thanks. One of my batteries went dead here tonight, so hopefully uh, we can uh, weather that particular storm, okay? All right, good. Now, uh, one more thing on your outline then, one possible response to the general call 
one possible response. We already know um, Isaiah 53, even verse 3, right? Jesus was prophesied as the one who would be despised and what? Do you know the verse? Rejected. Rejected of men. We know one possible response to the general gospel. People will reject it. Luke 7, 30. But the Pharisees and experts in the law rejected God's purpose for them. Uh, John John 6, verse 66, from this time, many of his followers turned back and no longer followed him. So the general call, people can accept it or reject it, right? Uh, Romans 10, verse uh, 16, not all the Israelites accepted the good news. And Romans 10, 21, uh, concerning Israel, he says, all day long, God has held out his hands to a disobedient and an obstinate people. God is patient, right? And he wants the seed to go as far as it can go. Uh, 1 Peter 2, 7, the stone the builders rejected, right, has become the capstone. Now, when people respond to the general call of the gospel, though, I mean, they're, they're, God willing, right, there are some, right, there are some, even if they're few, that respond to the gospel, turn to uh, First Peter. This is not even in your outline. This came to me uh, later in in uh, my preparation today that I couldn't type it on there. First Peter chapter t- uh, one, First Peter chapter one verse eight. Okay, if you can turn in that in your Bibles, I hope you'd be blessed or just jot this down. This is great. There are some who respond positively, right, to the general call. First Peter one verse eight. Though you have not seen him, right? Has anybody seen Jesus with their physical eyes? No. Though you have not seen him, you what? There are people who go, oh God, you love me enough to forgive my sin and save me? Oh, how can I love you back, right? You love him. And even though you do not see him now, see the promise of the gospel is Jesus is going to return again, right? Even though you don't see him now, you believe in him, right? It's like, show me Jesus. Here's the skeptic. Show me Jesus, right? Prove to me your Jesus is real and not just a uh, psychological fix, right? Even though you don't see him, you believe in him and are what? Filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. Oh, God, thank you. I know. Now, now be careful. This is not just a feeling because there's some days when I feel depressed and beaten down and wrecked. But Peter says the response of the gospel brings people an internal joy and a happiness which this earth cannot bring, right, through pizza and french fries. It just can't because it's God who has awakened a dead sinner's heart and where God calls that person says, you're mine, you're mine, you're my son, you're my daughter. And where that sinner says, oh God, I need you to be my savior. And and that blessed relationship has just been born. That's next week, regeneration, okay? Uh, comments or questions, anything that's brewing in your mind or heart at this point, this is a time for you to process a little bit till, uh, before we move on to section A. So uh, right now on Zoom, send, send me a question or comment. This was all on the general call of the gospel. That, that's I supplemented this. Uh, Grudem didn't give any pages specifically to it. So um, anybody... Uh, from our live group, a question or comment, the general call, um, it, something about your experience with it, doesn't matter. Uh, please go ahead. It seems like this general call is something that's done to unbelievers, not believers. It's a call to come to salvation. God's calling comes to believers, called in fellowship, called in whatever. That's all the believers. I, I think this is kind of artificial to say it's God's, I don't know. Well, again, yeah, the general call. Now, bear in mind, I mean, of course, if you've been saved for X amount of years, the the general call doesn't make a whole lot of sense to any of us, except for the fact, as Mike said, when we share the gospel randomly with people, we pray some one of them will be elect of God and come to saving faith. Is that what you're... 
Oh, correct. Yeah. Calling through his word to salvation. Correct. But guess what, Ruth? If you never open your mouth to share the gospel, Ruth, what happens then? What happens then? God will reach them with some other means, but it's going to be his word. Okay, but be careful. Yeah, and you just she just uh, said that. It's through his word that he reaches those who are elect. He's ordained this because otherwise he wouldn't need anybody to preach any gospel anywhere. He's ordained that the means of discovering the elect is when his word is proclaimed. By people. By people. It can be in a book, it can be in a movie. It by can people. Be a preacher, but it's yes. God calling them by means of people. Yes. So so this is this is where Yep, go into all the world and preach the gospel. So the general call and the specific call, of course, are combined here at the same time. Yep. I, I heard a comment maybe or over here somewhere. I don't, I'm not sure. The parable of the sower, is that a result of the gospel being called? You have four different responses. Yeah, responses to the seed. The, the, yeah. The pathway. Yep. The, you know, the... the yep. uh, uh, hollow ground, the rocks, and the rocky ground, and then the good ground. Are those, is that the gospel response in four different ways? I I, I would say so. Yes. No, no. I think we're in the same we're in the same ballpark here, right? Matthew thirteen. The comment is made: the sower in the seed, and it falls on four different types of soil, and we see that one of the soils, of course, is the good soil that produces good fruit, but three of the other types, right? Now, I've heard preachers teach it in two different ways, right? I might possibly be uh, all four soils at different times in my life, right? Thorny, uh, rocky, the, you know, the weeds and such, right? Uh, and I've heard uh, preachers teach that section of, of, you know, it's only at your conversion, right? I mean, some respond uh, with joy and produce fruit. And there's three other types of soil that represent people who, who don't have a saving response. No, any any follow-up? I mean, yeah. And right. And, and then, like the weeds, then they're choked. Yeah, they're yeah, choked yeah. out. Right. Right. Yep. Four different responses to God. Different but responses not, to the gospel. It might happen four different ways to, to the people around me, you know, and right. only in the final end of everything that I did actually call uh, the one at the good ground. The good soil. The yeah. Reason. Uh-huh. Good. Let's go back over here. Is it only responses as far as the gospel goes, or could it be anyone's response to God's word in whatever, you know, God may tell you to do something and you respond in a wrong way because of one of those reasons for a while, maybe later on, all of a sudden you realize, you know, I should have done that or whatever, and you respond to God's word. So it seems to me, I don't know if the context there is only salvation or if it okay. could be further on in your life. Sure. So yeah, Matthew 13, I'd have to look at it more closely too. Is it talking only about response to the gospel or could it be applied also to different seasons of my life and how I am responding positively or negatively to God and his words? Yeah, we'd have to look at that text a little uh, closer for that, but I think that's worthwhile. Let's, uh, friends, let's go. I did not see any questions or comments from Zoom on that section. So let's go to letter A and review a couple things now that Grudem gives us here on the effective call, the effective call of God. So again, many theologians equate the divine call uh, with regeneration, and that's the subject that we're going to talk about next week. So what's the effective call of God Let's just look at the definition that Grudem printed for us, please. 693, uh, the second paragraph, I think you see the italics, right? You can see the italics section. He gives us this definition. Effective calling is an act of God the Father speaking through the human proclamation of the gospel in which he summons people to himself in such a way that they respond in saving faith. 
So again, Romans 8, verse 30, those whom God predestined, he also called. So this is God's divine work. He calls people and then justifies and glorifies them. So what are the blessings of God's call? What are the blessings that come to a person whom God calls through the gospel? Grudem gave us 11 in the Bible verses. If you're looking at 692, go back to page 692, uh, that paragraph under letter A, effective calling. There are 11 brief uh, well, even some supplemental passages, pick one out that for you is a very special and unique blessing of God calling you. Because I, I can read all these, but that begs the question, you folks can read better than I can. Which of these blessings of God's effective calling most stand out for you? And Zoom, you can send me to your favorite pick. So we're on 692, the paragraph right underneath letter A. All the Bible passages are there and the, the brief statement of blessing that comes to us because of God's call. Pick your favorite and let me know which one it is. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Okay. So uh, coming out of darkness into his marvelous light, and Ruth was saying, I mean, the whole world just looked different when God brought me into his light. So using that particular picture, I like that one. Thanks. Someone else, which of the blessings of God's call uh, most stands out for you? I'm going to see if I get my mic to work again. Nope, that didn't do it. Even, even new batteries didn't help tonight. Sorry about that, folks. So anyone else, though? Any of those? I love Romans 1.6. Romans 1.6. Oh, Luann, I just see that. You popped that the exact same one. Belonging to Jesus. I belong to Jesus. That's a blessing of his divine call. Romans 1.6. That's what, <laughs> what you and I, sister, we picked the same one at the same time. Okay. Anybody else? Any one of those as you're skimming those. I see conformed to the image of his son. He's going to make me like Jesus. Fellowship with Jesus, the son of God. Wow. I mean, brought into his kingdom and glory. First Thessalonians called to be a saint. Yes. Saint uh, Sue, Saint Craig, Saint Jim and Debbie. It's like, oh, wow. Can you really call me that? No, Jesus does when he calls you into his kingdom and glory, right? The realm of peace, freedom, hope, holiness, uh, patient endurance. Maybe that's the one you weren't hoping to identify, right? That That's part of the blessing that he gives you, patient endurance, while we suffer uh, many different things here in this life, okay? So then in the very next paragraphs, Grudem addresses how are the elect called by God? And this is 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 14. Um, that's on the top of 693, the first full paragraph, 2 Thessalonians 2. It's through the human preaching of the gospel. He called you to this through our gospel. And Romans uh, 10, verse 17, uh, uh, Grudem did not include that one here. But consequently, faith comes from what? Faith comes from? hearing the message and the message is heard through the word of Christ. So this is how God has ordained it, right? I mean, it, it just always, it's like, God, you should have just taken your big megaphone from heaven and called out loud to all the elect and brought them to yourself. He chose the foolish things of the world, preaching. I mean, teachers and preachers and lay people, men and women and, and boys and girls to share the gospel, people who do it 
uh, many times, I suppose, quite imperfectly, right? Uh, and not with, a, with, with polish, uh, maybe not with success. Maybe you forgot the Bible verse you really wanted to share with somebody. He chooses through humble means uh, and the proclamation of the gospel. So now look at Grudem's statement, 693. I'm on the third paragraph, the third paragraph, line four, the third paragraph, line four. Although it is true that effective calling awakens and brings forth a response from us, we must always insist that this response still has to be a voluntary willing response in which the individual person puts his or her trust in Christ. This is reflecting what Grudem has said previously. You're not a robot. You're not a marionette, you know, on a string, right? You are a person created with choice and response. So uh, that statement I thought was, was pretty important, right? God is going to bring me his elect to himself, but it's going to come through the response and, and the choice that uh, a person has when the gospel is presented. So do you see Acts 16, 14 in the very next paragraph of Grudem? This is a precious passage that illustrates God's effective calling. This is um, the conversion of Lydia. Remember, she's a seller of purple. She's a business lady among business ladies, ladies. You got to study Lydia. And God opened her heart to give heed to what was said by Paul. He opened her heart. There, there's an illustration of how the effective calling of God works. He goes right into your heart and opens it, right? Because our hearts are hard. Our eyes are blind. Our ears are deaf. That's, that's what sin does to us, okay? So pray for God to do this to your loved ones. Um, Acts 16, 14. Pray, God, please open the heart of my loved one. They're not getting it. They don't like me preaching. They don't like me sharing. And I don't want to irritate them ad infinitum either. But God, would you please do the work to open the heart of my loved one? Um, and then maybe there's the day when I or someone else can share the gospel and they will at that point respond. Right? Um, so it, it may not happen right away. As Mike reminded us, uh, Matthew 13 uh, the seed does fall on different kinds of soil and with different kinds of responses. Now, um, one note there yet, there's there's an initial result of an effective calling. Grudem didn't address this because I think he's bringing it up later. Um, but I want to remind you of Acts 2.37 um, in the Pentecost account that uh, when Peter was preaching to the, the, the Jewish folks in, Pente uh, in Jerusalem at the time of Pentecost, um, he was reminding them of who Jesus is, right, as the Messiah, and that you, dear people, you're the ones who, who killed him and hung him up on a cross. You're the ones who are responsible for the death of Christ, who is Savior and Lord. And Acts 2.37 says that these people had a response, which was internal. Did, did anybody look it up, Acts 2.37? Mm -hmm. the Folks, heartburn, <laughs> not the kind that Prilosec helps. God did an eternal work of conviction. Conviction is called cut to their hearts. Romans 2.29 talks about circumcision of the heart. God has got to go in and cut out the, the bad part of our hard hearts. So circumcision. And the Old Testament used the exact same expression. Deuteronomy 10 is in your notes. Jeremiah 4, I think, is in your notes. And Deuteronomy 30 circumcising your hearts because we are stiff-necked and we are we are hardened because of sin. So those passages remind us that what I essentially, I need God. I need God to change me from the inside out, okay? That's our brief tour of letter A, the effective call, the effective call. That was our brief tour. Any questions or comments that have come up now in that section. So we, we've done the general call. We've done the effective call of God. We've looked at both of those here just kind of quick, uh, quickly in a review. Any questions or comments that are coming from the live group or Zoom? Zoom folks, have you sent me anything new you care to have addressed? 
Um, somebody, somebody marked down, of course, the, the, uh, the favorite blessing, uh, of, of God's calling patient endurance of suffering. Thank you for that one. Yeah. Belonging to Jesus were saints, patience, uh, endurance of suffering again. So great. I got lots of you folks called out of darkness. I see that one there. Someone said, that's my favorite blessing. So good. Many of you zoomers sent me those. I appreciate that. Um, and isn't God good? Isn't God good, right? To do all those things for us because of Jesus. Now, here we go. Letter B. Letter B. We're on page 694. Letter B. 694. The elements of the gospel call. Now, we know God chose human people. You. I mean, you dear folks who put your pants on one leg at a time. As much as he's asked human preachers and teachers, right, to proclaim the gospel call. It's a requirement for us to do that. It's a privilege and it's a responsibility for us, right? So what are the elements of the gospel call? Grudem outlines three. Number one, an explanation of the facts concerning salvation. We've got to be able to share the basic facts of our problem before God and how God outlines a relationship with him as possible. So you have gospel tracks for our live friends on your tables tonight. Take as many as you want and review them to see if they work. Some of you keep some of those um, tracks, the, uh, um, the f- four spiritual laws or um, uh, God knows me personally, any of those tiny little tracks, you keep them in your wallet, your purse, because you can use those or share them with people at any given time. Um, but, you know, they're helpful. They're very helpful. Um, I've, I've used over the years something Dave Marshall put me on, which is, is using uh, these two books, which I think I've used and shown to you before. So the two books in sharing the gospel with people, this black book is the book of my sin. And this is only one volume of it but it contains the record of my sin. Now I've accumulated many, many volumes of that. And the red book though, is the picture of Jesus blood who came to the cross to forgive my sin. Here's a picture of Jesus life. Can you see in the pages that there's nothing because this represents his holiness and his righteousness. My book is filled with sin, every page, right? This is my problem before God. Jesus came to be my savior and to forgive me and to give me his righteousness, which is the book of his perfection and his holiness. So I've used those and you might have used other gospel tracts over the time. Grudem gives you a three-point basic facts of the gospel on page 694. Number one, all people have sinned, everybody. Even the good ones have sinned. Number two, the penalty for sin, God says, it's his penalty, is death, Romans 6, 23. And number three, Christ died to pay for my sin, Romans 5, verse 8. Jesus came to be a substitute to save me and to pay my penalty for sin. That, that's simple and sweet. The gospel is not a complicated message, And it can be said simply in five words. This is now the next part of your outline. This is not Grudem. This is what I typically share. So you're looking at the right column, the gospel plan in five words. This is adapted from James Kennedy. Some of you may remember him. He's with the Lord now, but he did evangelism explosion which was a process to train lay people to be able to share the gospel with anybody. And uh, you literally can share it in five words. Are you ready? You can jot them down if you like, if you're at home with uh, the outline. Heaven. So number one, five words. And five words is easier to remember than a phone number, right? Phone number with an area code. You got a lot of more digits there. So number one, heaven. Number two, me. Number three, God. Number four, Jesus. And number five, faith. So five words. Share the gospel in five words. Heaven is a free gift 
that God wants to give to everybody. It's his home. He wants you to be in his home with him. It's a free gift, but it's not earned or deserved. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 It's by grace and it's not by works. Number two, me. What does the Bible say about me? The Bible says I'm a sinner for all have sinned, Romans 3, 23. And the Bible says I can't save myself. I cannot erase my sin or make myself good enough to meet God's standard, which Matthew 5, 48 says is perfection. Be perfect, therefore, as your Father in heaven is perfect. So here's my problem. The Bible says I'm a sinner and I can't save myself. Well, if I can't save myself because my eyes are blind and because my ears are deaf, then then where's the good news? Here's the good news. God, number three, is loving and forgiving. Exodus 34, he's the Lord who is compassionate and gracious. He's slow to anger. He abounds in love and faithfulness, and he maintains love to thousands He forgives wickedness, rebellion, and sin. But the exact same passage says God is also just. He does not leave the guilty sinner unpunished. So I learned, yes, the Bible says God is loving, but it also says that he is just and that he punishes sin. That's where we get to number four, Jesus The Bible says Jesus is the perfect son of God who left heaven, came to earth to be my substitute. He's the perfect holy son of God who bore my sin in my place. The cross is where the gospel is best seen because God laid my sin on Jesus who is holy and perfect. And he paid a penalty for my sin that I could never in a million years ever pay for, right? And at the cross, Jesus pays for my sin, and he gives me his righteousness, right? So he takes my sin on me at the cross, my whole book and my 10 volumes of it. And at the cross, he gives me a gift I can't pay for and I don't deserve. He gives me his perfection and his holiness so that I am fit to enter into his house in heaven. And number five, faith. This good news must be believed and received, right? And it begins with repentance. I think of Luke 15, 21, the prodigal son. After eating slop for how long? (laughs) The boy came to his senses, which was the grace of God. And he says, the servants of my father at home have it far better than I do. I'm going to go back And I'm going to say I have sinned against heaven and against you. Sin, friends, is both horizontal. It's against people. And sin is vertical. It's against God. Even if you could remedy your sin problem against people, you can never remedy that against God. So I need to honestly come before God and repent. My sin has ruined my life and it's ruin my relationship with God. But this is where the Bible bids us to trust in the work of Christ, right? Saving faith is not just having the knowledge of the gospel in your head. It's not just knowing Jesus came and died for your sin, because James 2.19 says even the devil knows that. So what? The devil knows that, but he's not saved. So that's not what saving faith is. Saving faith is not either like the temporal faith that some people express. Temporal, meaning you're in a serious accident or you you have a serious crisis in your life and you quickly call out, oh, God, help me. And by God's grace, many times he helps that person, whether they're saved or not. And then when the crisis is over, people forget to trust God or to ask God for anything else. That's a temporal faith. That's not a saving faith. The Bible says a saving faith is a faith that latches on to Jesus. Like um, Martha at the tomb, she grabbed hold of his feet and she says, I'm not letting go for anything, right? That's what a biblical saving faith is, to grab hold of Christ 
and to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, right? You've done the work I cannot do. Lord Jesus, forgive my sin and save me. And the Bible says he's more than willing to do so. Does anybody want to do a cartwheel right now? How about a snow angel outside in the bitter cold? Oh, Jesus, thank you for providing for me forgiveness. And thank you for giving me yourself um, as the gift. So saving faith is clinging to him. You might use any other kinds of gospel uh, presentations. I mean, the order of the five words, I've messed it up uh, every time I share the, five, the gospel of five words. The order changes. It's however the Holy Spirit has it come out of my head and my mouth. It, it's not a presentation, folks. It's a person. We've got to come to the person, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And, and that's why many people don't respond because their eyes are, what, blind? Their ears are deaf. They can't hear the glory of Christ in his cross. They can't. And thus we need God to penetrate a hard heart. So for you friends tonight, I mean, you might have a family member or a loved one, you know, who, who has either started with Christ and left Christ, who has never come to Christ, never trusted Christ. We never stop praying and we never stop inviting people to know Jesus as their Savior and Lord. We never do because we don't know when God will turn a heart. What about the, that thief on the cross? Did, did, did the two thieves have a chance to be saved? The two thieves on the cross next to Jesus on either side? Yeah, both had a chance to be saved. The end of their life, the last hours of their life. And Jesus promised the one, you'll be with me in paradise. You see? So we'll never give up, ever. Because we don't know the holy work that God will yet do in, in a loved one who either hasn't started with Christ or a loved one who has left Christ. We don't know, right? But, but I'm banking on Christ. I'm banking on his grace. I'm banking on his love. Uh, and I'm banking on his sovereign work to call people from the, from the inside out. I'm not slick enough to convince anybody that this is true. I'm not. I mean, look at my hair. Look at my face. I'm wearing a goofy mask. What, what makes anybody think I could convince you that this is the only way to go, right? Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. God does that work, and I'm so grateful he's done it in my life. Well, uh, number two, second element of the gospel, an invitation to respond to Christ personally in repentance and faith. There are many invitations uh, to know Christ personally in the New Testament, right? Our memory verse for tonight, Matthew uh, 11, 20, 30, come to me. Jesus says, all you who are weary and burdened, there, there's the invitation, come to me. He's a real person. He's not a two-dimensional piece of paper. He's the living son of God. People have to do business with God. This is the only way to be saved. Not business with a church, right? Not business with somebody's, uh, you know, I used to call it uh, hula hoops. D did you ever hula hoop? Anybody on Zoom? No, none of you. None of you were ever so foolish as me. Oh, Kate says, it's not about jumping through some church's hoops. You know, oh, this is the way you got to do it to be right with us and to be a member of the church. And, you know, you got to do this, that, and the other thing. No, it's about, it's about answering the invitation that God gives in his precious word. Come to me. Um, John 1, verse 11, do you see that in your text? We're on page 694, 694, some of the bottom paragraphs there. Jesus came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed on his name, he gave the right to become children of God, right? He gives that gracious gift. And children who are born not of natural descent or of human decision— we give God the glory for changing my mind and my heart and that I respond to him. Revelation 3.20, here I am. Jesus is personally standing at the door of your house and he says, I'd love to come in as Savior and Lord. Right? Will you respond? Uh, and, and, and folks, I mean, honestly, it's a yes or a no. Right? Will you respond? He's knocking at the door. 
He wants to have a relationship with you. So will, will you respond? Will you say, Jesus, I need you, right? Um, Revelation 22, the, the last chapter of Holy Scripture, the spirit and the bride say, come. It's an invitation the Holy Spirit gives, and the bride is the church. We are to be the inviting agents, inviting people to come. Whoever is thirsty, let him come. See, that mirrors Isaiah 55 from the Old Testament. And then there are two necessary responses to the gospel. This is not in Grudem. I'm going to introduce it now so it gives uh, our Zoom friends a lot of chance next week to bring a lot of questions. No, uh, chapter 35 on the 17th of this month. Chapter 35, when we talk about conversion, there are two necessary responses that people have to the gospel. Number one, repentance of sin, and number two, trust in Christ. That's what the Bible says. So Acts 20, 21 Paul says, I've declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in Jesus, clinging to Jesus as Savior. Um, Luke 24, 47, repentance and forgiveness of sins should be preached. Uh, Romans 2, verse 4, God's kindness leads you to repentance. And you might add Romans 10, verse 9, uh, that if you believe in your heart that God raised Christ from the dead, you will be saved, right? So acknowledging our sin, confessing it to God, right? I mean, you don't, you, you can, but you don't need to go to a closed door with some priest somewhere. That, that's not a biblical requirement. You can, if that would aid you or help you, but the confession's got to be to God whom I'm sinned against, uh, and trusting in his solution, Jesus Christ. So we're going to talk more about these two necessary responses to the gospel in chapter 35, which comes in two weeks, okay? Chapter 35, which comes in two weeks. Now I'm on page 695, 695, um, the first paragraph there at the top of the page, but I'm looking at the last sentence of that paragraph. Hopefully you can find it. If either the need to repent of sins or the need to trust in Christ for forgiveness is neglected, there is not a full and true proclamation of the gospel. And this is where I fear that perhaps uh, some folks have uh, missed it and don't fully understand the gospel. A, a full uh, gospel proclamation has to call people to acknowledge and confess sin to God and to trust in Christ. So again, chapter 35, if you've got questions about that, I understand there's segments of Christianity that say repentance is not necessary at all. Uh, and I think I've heard that drifting around our, our church corridors a little bit. So if that's you, friend, uh, send me some emails, and you know we're going to talk about that in particular in two weeks, chapter 35. Okay, number three, here's the third thing of the proclamation of the gospel. Um, so the, the, uh, the elements of the gospel, we share that. An invitation to respond to those elements. Do you believe this or not? And finally, a promise of forgiveness and eternal life. Look out, I'm going out to do a snow angel. God says, whoever believes in him, John 3, 16, shall not perish, but have what? Oh, Oh, the glory of what God gives in salvation. Everlasting life starts the moment we believe. It starts. Not you got to die and get there. It starts the moment you believe. Acts 3.19, um, that repentance, uh, uh, repent therefore and turn again that your sins might be blotted out. Is there anybody whose record tonight still looks like this and you have volumes of this that means your sin's not blotted out jesus came so that your record would look like this right the perfect righteousness of christ so that that means we need to ask him to forgive and give us that gift which we can never earn by or or get on our own it's not sold at the dollar store either by the way Number three, whoever comes to me, I will never drive out. Jesus will keep you in a relationship with him 
from the moment you trust him to the moment that you see him face to face. So that gives us a little break right there, friends. We're at the end of section B. Uh, process out loud any comments or questions. Send me something on Zoom here. Send me a chat. We've just covered the section B, the elements of the gospel call. The elements of the gospel call. Anything common zooming? Anything you zooming over? No? Zooming over? So far, so good? That was the easy part, everybody says, right? That was the easy part. The elements of the gospel call. Super. Okay. Then but we've got a tiny little section left, right? The importance. How important is this gospel call? How important? The proclamation of the gospel is the way that God has ordained that those whom he's elected would be discovered. That's how important this is. You and I don't get to look into the book of life to see whom God elected in eternity past. But when we proclaim the gospel to people, and when by God's grace, you see some respond positively, we get to see the joy of God opening the book and showing us um, those that he has saved for himself. So the importance of the gospel is huge uh, in proclaiming it. Uh, because then uh, we find out whom God is stirring in and working in Romans 10, 14. How are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? How can people believe the gospel and trust Christ unless they've heard of him? This is what drives uh, ministry here, small groups here, Bible studies in your home here, right? Right. Um, we, we've, we, we've got to start, uh, encouraging each other again, uh, to, to make that opportunity in our own homes and start inviting a coworker or somebody, a friend or a family member, and just saying, Hey, are you interested? Let, let's do a little Bible study. We'll just open it up and we'll talk about what God is saying here. Right. Because people can't believe in the gospel until they've heard it until they've heard it. That's plain and simple on that. Grudem says, you might see under letter C, God does not automatically save somebody without a willing response. He, he just doesn't do that. He's chosen, God has chosen to use human people speaking in the gospel. It may come through a, a radio show, uh, a tract, uh, a video, a DVD, a book, right? He may use any of those particular means, uh, but that's what he's chosen you know, um, to use. And, and we want to be a part of that. So uh, God speaks in three ways to us, intellectually, to our emotions, and to our will. I like this little summary of Grudem, page 695 at the bottom. God speaks to our intellect. How? He wants us to know the facts of the gospel, right? I'm a sinner, and Jesus is the Son of God who came to save me. That's a fact, God speaks to my emotions. He personally invites me to respond. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I'll give you rest. That, that's a personal response that appeals to our emotions. And I suppose if you're not wearied and you're not burdened, you, you might find yourself saying, no, uh, not interested. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll you know, take my pillow and, and, and my favorite bag of chips and, and sit at the couch and watch TV. Uh, but that doesn't promise a whole lot of, of eternal life in it. But God appeals to our emotions. And number three, he appeals to our will. He appeals to our will. Will you acknowledge sin and will you trust Christ? Or will you not? Do, do you not think that there's a particular problem? So bottom line, friends, uh, tonight, bottom line for us, right? Do each one of us understand the facts of the gospel. This is a yes or no. Have you got your pen or pencil ready? Just jot down a yes or no. This is for you. Do you tonight understand the facts of the gospel? Yes or no. Have you personally heard God calling you to himself? Have you heard his invitation to you to come in repentance and faith to his son, Jesus, the Savior? That's a yes or a no. Uh, number three, have you responded to God's call? If you've heard his call, have you responded to it? That, that's a yes or a no, right? 
All, all of these are fairly simple. So if you've answered yes, brothers and sisters, humbly praise God. He's called you. He's done a work which is supernatural. If you've heard God's call, if you responded to God's call, that's a supernatural work. God has worked in your heart and in your life. But if you answered no to any of those simple questions, right? Uh, what, what are your questions? Let's go back to what are your questions? Email me, find somebody you can talk to who's a little bit more personal than this crazy Zoom thing. But connect with somebody if, if there's one of those you said no to, right? Uh, and, and then what's your next step? If you said no to any of those, what's your next step? What will you do? Because uh, be mindful, as soon as we shut off here in a few moments, I don't know that you'll have the chance to process a saving relationship with Jesus Christ tonight or tomorrow. I don't know that. I'm not going to promise that because neither does scripture, right? That's the urgency of the gospel. If you hear God's voice today, don't tune him out and don't say, I'll get to you after I sort the mail, after I clean the dishes, or after I've rested a little while. Deal with God when he speaks to you. That's the urgency of the gospel. Because I don't know if I'll be here tomorrow. I don't. I don't have any plans to not be here tomorrow. <laughs> don't misunderstand me. It's none of us know. We never, none of us know. So Hebrews 3.13, today is the day of salvation. Today is the day to hear God's voice. He, he, he is speaking through his holy and precious word. And, and that's a blessing that um, is by grace and by grace alone. So final questions or comments, folks, this is how unbelievable the gospel goes. I might be five minutes early. And because because I can't have answered everything for anybody, so please send a final comment or question via a chat. Please go ahead. Live class. I mean, this is like, oh no, what's happened, Robert? You can't end five minutes early. Something's wrong with me tonight. I never am done early. Am I, Mel? Ever? Mel's my deacon of accountability. Short chat. Short chat. It, so Robert should go shorter as well, too. It was a, a blessing, though, wasn't it? I'm going to check Zoom, though, one more time. Let's check if somebody sent me something here. And, uh, oh, somebody said, great, great, great lesson. Great. Praise the Lord uh, for that as well, too. So, friends, here we go. I'm closing with uh, the hymn that Grudem uh, printed, page 698, 698, because this is a delightful old hymn talking about the gospel call. Do you see it on 698? Never met Horatius uh, Bonar, 1846. Yeah, that, that's a little before my time. I love the last verse, if you'll read along you know, with me, if you care to. This old hymn, I heard the voice of Jesus say, I am this dark world's light. Look unto me, Thy morn shall rise and all thy day be bright. I looked to Jesus and I found in him my star, my sun. And in that light of life, I'll walk till traveling days are done. Friends, isn't that good news? I mean, yeah, it's poetic. I get it. Yep, it's written in a different kind of a language. That's the promise of the gospel call. Respond to Christ, and he's going to walk with me, the footstep thing, till my traveling days are done in this life, and then I get to see him face to face. Father, thank you for the blessing of this teaching and this doctrine, the gospel call. God, thank you for sharing the details and the facts of the gospel so simply for us all over the pages of Holy Scripture. Thank you, God for calling me to saving relationship and faith in your son, Jesus Christ. God, thank you for piercing my heart and showing me how horrible my sin is and, and how it separates me from you. And God, thank you that you made my ears hear the good news, that Christ is my savior from sin. So, Father, we celebrate your call 
into our hearts and into our lives. And Father, I pray then that, that this isn't just another sweet lesson that we learn from your holy book, but that tonight you'd put on our hearts and minds, Holy Spirit, those people that you want us to share the gospel with. God, please give us names and faces, put those on our minds and hearts tonight or tomorrow of the people that you want us to share the gospel with. Because maybe there's somebody you've prepared, you've opened their heart, uh, you've done a divine work, you've changed the soil of their hearts. And so, Father, may we be useful, may we be humbly obedient, God, to be your mouthpieces in these latter days. We pray that a harvest of souls will be seen, Lord, not because of our work or because of our presentation, but because of your work in and through us. May Christ be honored and glorified, our Savior and Lord. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen.